Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sound Strategic. I am Maya Nowens. The 6th and 9th of August this year marked the 75th anniversary of the U.S. bombings of the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the closing months of World War II. These two bombings remain the only time nuclear weapons have been used in an active conflict. And following these events, Japan surrendered on the 15th of August and formally signed the surrender on September 2nd aboard the USS Missouri. As a result, their use has had a profound impact on how the world views nuclear weapons to this day. Why this has been the case and how it has changed over time is the subject of today's episode. To help me explore this topic, I'm joined by Mark Fitzpatrick, Associate Fellow and former Executive Director of the IISS Americas Office, and Dana Allen, Senior Fellow for U.S. Foreign Policy and Transatlantic Affairs, as well as Editor of the IISS Survival Series. Thank you both for joining me today. Great to be here. Thank you. Perhaps to start with a broad question, could you tell us why the 75th anniversary is so important to commemorating the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Why is this relevant today? The legacy of, of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which we're going to be discussing, has obviously shaped the way we think about nuclear weapons because it was, as you, as you said in your introduction, the one time they were used um, in, a, in an act of war. And the other thing to say, and I hope we're going to talk about this, is that some of those lessons may be in the process of being lost, and that's something to be somewhat concerned about. Yeah, to amplify what Dana just said, um, during these 75 years of the nuclear age, uh, there were periods of great angst uh, marching in the streets, anti-nuclear demonstrations. There was uh, a great buildup of nuclear weapons during the Cold War, and then a diminution of them. Three quarters of them were destroyed. But the, um, that's now plateaued out. We're not destroying any more nuclear weapons. Uh, we're, the nations that have them are, are, are improving them, making them more dangerous, I would say. And uh, the public is not as concerned. The last point about you know the significance of 75 years of the nuclear age. It's important to realize that you know this is also 75 years during which the nuclear weapons have not been used again in anger, uh, and uh, and that's a, a record uh, people hadn't anticipated. And uh, the question is, you know, can that continue, um, or do we have to do something to make sure that uh, that it uh, it doesn't happen again? Those are really excellent points. Now let's turn to the bombings themselves and what we are actually commemorating. The bombings are often given as the reason the Japanese ultimately surrendered in 1945, and in doing so saved the lives of thousands of U.S. soldiers. Do you think that this narrative is justified, or should we be thinking about this in a different way? Well, let me say that um, that was uh, certainly what President Truman believed at the time, that um, that the bombs were necessary to end the war early. Uh, the United States had seen how fiercely the Japanese had fought uh, in the Battle of Okinawa and uh, worried that um, you know this would be even more fiercely fought uh, during an, in, an invasion and, and an atomic weapon would obviate the need for a U.S. invasion of Japan, draw the war uh, to a close, save both Japanese and American lives. But it's a false narrative because actually no invasion of the homeland of the Japanese main islands uh, was actually planned. And the Japanese were on the verge of surrender. They were holding out for one thing. I mean, they wanted several things, but the real thing that they were holding out for, the reason they didn't surrender until August 15th, is that they wanted to preserve the emperor system. And the United States in its Possum Declaration, um, you know, had said unconditional surrender. It wasn't until the United States clarified in a very subtle message from then Secretary of State Burns that uh, Japan could uh, decide on its own form of government in other words, keeping the emperor system, that the Japanese could then grab on that and say, okay, as long as the emperor is preserved, we'll continue. Two other points quickly. What really caused the Japanese to surrender was not the atomic weapon. If you look at all the um, the notes and the documents from the archives of, of how the Japanese were, you know, the, 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 the war cabinet, what were they thinking? They didn't hardly even consider the bombings of Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. What they were really concerned about was the Soviet invasion. They worried that the Soviets would come and take over Hokkaido. They didn't want that to happen. They much preferred to uh, surrender to the United States. And then the United States Navy had imposed a blockade on Japan that was starving the nation. That, more than any potential invasion, was really a well, killer uh, app that uh, caused the Japanese to not be able to prosecute the war anymore. So three things, Russian invasion, 
naval blockade and the U.S. modification of the Potsdam Declaration to allow the emperor. That's what led to the Japanese surrender. That's what historians now are saying who are looking at this carefully. I, I would just add to what Mark said. I, I, I think his um, stipulation at the beginning is very important for understanding um, the decision to use the bomb, which is that, um, you know, it, I, I, I think this is sometimes misunderstood. There never really was a decision. Once it was ready, um, President Truman didn't really consider the possibility of of, of of not using a weapon um, that he he saw rightly or wrongly as as necessary to save you know in the first instance American lives, um, but you know I think it's also um, important from our perspective to appreciate from from a historical perspective to appreciate that you know the immense destructiveness of this act against civilians was a line, was a Rubicon that had already been crossed in the war. Um, and, you know, this is uh, the, the uh, fire bombings of Tokyo, the fire bombings of, of some German city of, of Dresden as well. These were, you know, acts that from today's perspective would definitely look like war crimes. And at, at the same time, um, it was, you know, it was really a, a a total war uh, in which the United States was using every every means, whether strategically sound or not, uh, to win. And so I don't think that, um, you know, I don't think it detracts from the, the horribleness of the act to try to put yourselves in the place of the American president at the time and American planners at the time and realize that they weren't really thinking about not doing it. Hmm. And so in terms of the impact of the bombings themselves, what, what impact do you think they had on the national psyches of Japan and the United States? What lessons do you think each country took away from their experience of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings? Well, I have a particular interest in this question because um, when I was in university, I studied, um, I took a couple classes with John Hersey, who wrote the book that actually are actually it was a series it was a it was a very long report that uh, took up an entire issue of the New Yorker um, and bec and was published as a book called Hiroshima. This was a, a rather amazing instance episode in which a work of journalism can be said to have really contributed to what you call the sort of national psyche and the national consciousness about about nuclear weapons, because um, this was not a p particularly polemical work. Hersey just went to Japan and inter interviewed survivors and wrote about the experience from the perspective of the Japanese. But w it was absolutely electrifying in terms of the way it was received in the United States, because um, just one year after the war, Americans who had been involved in this incredibly savage war with 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 a, a Japanese em, enemy that was de, demonized in racial terms, um, came to feel incredible. I don't. I won't, wouldn't say remorse, but incredible empathy for the victims of that act. Um, and uh, so I think that the immediacy of being able to understand what the experience of an atomic bombing was like really did have an impact on de the development over the next few years of, of what we would call the nuclear taboo. And, and from the uh, Japanese perspective, um, uh, the Japanese psyche changed uh, uh, drastically from before the war and after the war. The militaristic uh, uh, governments uh, ended, um, you know, they adopted the peace constitution imposed uh, by, the, uh, by the United States. Uh, the, the atomic weapons uh, were, were part of what contributed to this um, uh, peaceful mentality. Uh, it, it also actually gave uh, Japan um, uh, a sense of uh, being able to portray themselves as victims. Uh, you know, quite contrary to them having been uh, the instigators of the war, the aggressors in, in China. Uh, the Chinese and Koreans uh, really dislike this uh, suggestion that uh, Japan was a victim. Uh, 
Um, but I don't, Japan doesn't overplay the victimization. I mean, you go to Hiroshima. I went there at age 17. It profoundly affected me. Uh, you read the uh, the Cenotop, and it, it, it doesn't cast um, accusations against anybody. It, it, it just says, um, you know, rest in peace for the sins shall not be uh, repeated. It puts it in a passive uh, verb tense that, you know, who create, who was the sinner? I mean, uh, you know, could Japan, yes, for starting the war, uh, those who dropped the bomb, yes, maybe. But anyway, it's, it, it leaves it in a very um, uh, non, non-accusatory fashion. And I think this, um, this sense of Japan uh, having been um, experienced the atomic bomb contributed greatly to Japan's um, promotion of nuclear non-proliferation, although Japan has such an ambiguous policy, I guess we'll get into that a little bit about both needing nuclear weapons to protect itself, but being against them. Now, the bombings and the potential devastation uh, similar weapons can inflict essentially created the concept of nuclear deterrence and the taboo that you just mentioned, Mark, uh, over the use of nuclear use of nuclear weapons. So how do you square these two seemingly opposing concepts in modern strategic thinking? And how do you think these two ideas informed international discourse and policy around nuclear weapons since 1945? So to start with, um, you know, the, the idea that the nuclear um, bombing ended the war uh, was, was central to the concept of nuclear deterrence. Uh, if, if nuclear weapons can end a war, they can also prevent a war. And, uh, and that's been um, the, the strategic logic of the United States and its allies for 75 years. And you can't deny it. I mean, there hasn't been a war between the superpowers during this time. And, and uh, the mutually assured destruction uh, doctrine, as crazy as it sounds, uh, you know, was central to that. Uh, we, we didn't want to you know, get in a war that would lead to a nuclear exchange that could annihilate uh, both parties. Um, and, and this contradiction um, then between the, the nuclear taboo in Japan and uh, reliance on, on nuclear deterrence is uh, is an ambiguity that an ambivalence that uh, the J- Japanese uh, foreign policy has struggled with for years. Uh, you know, right right now, there, there, recently there was a, um, a couple of years ago uh, a, a, a treaty to ban nuclear weapons was adopted. It created new international law. Uh, Japan, uh, you know, would would have normally been a proponent of that treaty, but wasn't because it it relies on nuclear weapons for its defense. I would add something to what Mark said, which is, I think, slightly complicating this issue. To to say that there is a a, a contradiction between deterrence and an anti-nuclear taboo. I think is right on one level because you, you're absolutely. Cor- I mean, it's it is absolutely correct that strategies based on deterrence are based on annihilation of 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 civilians, um, a, a potential annihilation of civilians. But of course, as 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 nuclear deterrence developed as a concept, it was very much a concept of avoiding the use of nuclear weapons. So it's not, you know, it's not a complete um, contradiction. Um, one thing, though, though, that I think is important to recognize is that the taboo developed before deterrence, mutual deterrence, was a reality because the taboo started to develop when the United States was the only country possessing the atomic weapon. You know, it's often uh, Harry Truman, President Truman has often been quoted to the effect that he lo- never lost any sleep over the decision to, to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Which is in line with, with with what I was suggesting earlier that it was never really a decision. But he very this does not mean that he didn't recognize the enormity and in a sense the evil of these weapons. I mean he very quickly said, uh, "I, you know, these are not normal weapons. They're weapons that are used to kill women and children. They're not." a normal weapon that we should use in a war unless we really have to. And he was saying this at a time when there were American generals who had a very different view, that it was that that these were just powerful weapons that the United States should use if it ever got into a war, for example, with the Soviet Union. Um, now, that possibility was rapidly, within a few years, started to be, become a lot less um, plausible precisely because the Soviet Union developed its own nuclear weapons. And um, over time, over the course of the 1950s, 
the reality of mutual deterrence um, developed. So on the point of nuclear deterrence, then, do we think that it's weakening today or are people simply forgetting the lessons of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I wouldn't say that nuclear deterrence is weakening. Um, <laughs> you know, every nuclear armed state uh, still firmly believes in the uh, in the uh, concept of nuclear deterrence, and that's why they they won't give them up. That's why they have no interest at all in a ban the bomb treaty. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the North Korea uh, uh, advocates uh, nuclear deterrence as the rationale for acquiring nuclear weapons. So nuclear deterrence is live and kicking uh, very much. So uh, the question is, is is disarmament is the other uh, side of this coin? Is that uh, concept uh, weakening? And I would say, yes, it is. Um, you know, there there have been fluctuations over the years of times of, of great popular um, uh, demand for or disarmament, you know, um, the marches at Granham uh, um, Common in, in England and uh, marches in New York uh, up to a, a, a million people uh, 40 years ago. Uh, you don't see anything like that today. The anti-nuclear movement is uh, is kind of minuscule, really. There, there, there are many good organizations that are promoting it, plowshares and uh, 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 nuclear zero and so forth. But the popular attitudes have uh, have not really been very great. Now, why is that? Well, one is we've become acclimated to nuclear weapons, and and secondly, um, it's actually because of the of the um, the power of nuclear deterrence and the fact that. Uh, we are not um, about to be in a nuclear war. We're, we're not about to be in any kind of a war with uh, with Russia or hopefully not with China either. So the, the idea that nuclear weapons might come raining down upon us is not in anybody's psyche. It, this generation has, it doesn't grow up thinking that there will be a nuclear war. And so that's why uh, you know people aren't that worried about it. They don't foresee it happening. But if they thought clearly about the possibility of a nuclear accident, of a nuclear exchange, um, a, a war that North Korea might spark or or that India and Pakistan might get into a war that could coat the world with a cloud that would uh, reduce uh, harvest by a, a quarter, starve a, a, a billion people. We should think about this. Yeah, let me um, add something to that, which I think is very important, which is that uh, it's not just the disarmament, the, our abolition movement that is weakening, um, or, or the consciousness, sort of the popular anti-nuclear sentiment. Um, it's also the healthy fear of statesmen leading nuclear powers who, you know, were not advocates of nuclear abolition, but have developed, you know, a sense of of the danger of these weapons and the need to control them. So not just abolition, but arms control is weakening, and this is something we've really seen in in the past. Um, well, I don't want to say it started with the Trump administration. I think it's been um, it, it's a longer term process than that. Although you will recall that. Uh, President Obama came into office uh, saying that he was um, going, to commit the, going to commit the United States to actually supporting the eventual goal of the complete elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, that looks highly utopian from the standpoint of 2020. What, what, what is really concerning is that um, the major instruments of arms control between the United States and first the Soviet Union and then Russia are starting to wither away. And the leaders of, of Russia and the United States don't seem to have a terrible interest in preserving or renewing them. You know, I think that is that is something that's very scary. Right. And of course, China has no interest in joining them, so they've said, uh, or any possible new arms control regime uh, in the future, as they see it simply as a bilateral uh, issue between the United States and Russia um, for, for, for reasons uh, such as China's uh, number of uh, nuclear weapons being far lower uh, than those of uh, the two great powers. But um, that being said, with uh, this theory of uh, mutually assured destruction. Um, do we actually think that deterrence has been stabilizing or destabilizing in international relations? Most theorists would argue that it's been stabilizing um, uh, because, as I say, uh, it has uh, 
uh, contributed. It's not been the main factor, but it's certainly been a main uh, contributing factor to um, the absence of war between the superpowers. So um, uh, there's a stabilizing uh, factor there, but there's also a paradox of uh, of instability. Um, you know, if you have nuclear weapons and uh, you think they're going to uh, protect you, uh, you may be um, uh, more willing to engage in provocative behavior. And the case that's most uh, relevant to this is the, is the Pakistan case where, um, you know, Pakistan um, over the past uh, uh, two decades uh, since it, it acquired nuclear weapons has engaged in some um, you know, provocative acts, uh, knowing uh, anticipating that um, that their nuclear um, uh, deterrence uh, would protect them. And uh, if you were Pakistani, you would point to India and, and point to what you would uh, call their provocative acts. It's a little bit less clear, quite a bit less clear. Uh, so they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, so it's not a it's not a clear yes to the question, are nuclear weapons stabilizing? I think the United States and the Soviet Union um, came, developed a a relationship of deterrence that was not simply inherent to their possession of nuclear weapons, but had to be learned. Um, they came very close um, in the Cuban Missile Crisis to a nuclear war. And it was actually that experience that um, contributed a great deal to the decision from both capitals, from both Washington and Moscow, to try to find a way to restrain their rivalry to re and and to manage their uh, you know the risk of a crisis leading to a nuclear war so um you know i think the short answer to your question is that in general the possession of nuclear weapons i mean I, it has been stabilizing at the superpower level um, but only because they decided to make it so i'm very glad that dana brought up the cuban um, because uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, that is, it wasn't a war, thankfully. But um, but it, it, it was so lucky um, that uh, John F. Kennedy didn't listen to his generals, all of whom wanted an invasion, none of whom knew that uh, uh, there were active, ready-to-fire, operationally ready uh, Soviet missiles on the island, and they would have been fired in the event of an invasion. There are so many things that the United States didn't know. They didn't know how many Soviet troops were on the island. They didn't know how many weapons were there. Uh, they didn't know that the that the Soviet submarines had orders uh, uh, to allow them that allowed them to fire if fired upon. They didn't know that um, oh, there's just so many misperceptions. We didn't learn about any of this until years later. So uh, luck played a very important role in um, the avoidance of nuclear war these past 75 years. Now, maybe we're turning back to Japan until very recently, as we've discussed, Japan maintained quite a pacifist stance in terms of national defense, but there are signs of this changing. And what do we think this is a reflection of? Is this a, a reflection of um, Japan perhaps changing in how it views uh, nuclear weapons, or is it just a reaction to more pressing security concerns posed by North Korea, but also, of course, China? Uh, let me answer this one, because I, I, I've thought about this a lot. I've looked at this a lot. And it's a, it's a mistake to equate in any way uh, Japan's uh, desire to become a more normal country in terms of its defense posture with the nuclear question. Two separate issues. Uh, you know, Prime Minister Abe uh, would like uh, the constitution changed uh, uh, so that there wouldn't uh, be this wording that uh, prohibits um, uh, armed forces. Of course, they have armed forces. They call them self-defense forces. Uh, that prohibits Japan from having an offensive uh, capability. They would like to be able to uh, have an offensive capability vis-a-vis -vis, uh, North Korea. But uh, Prime Minister Abe does not want nuclear weapons. Uh, and there's nothing he's ever said that suggests uh, that he does. There is a small minority on the, uh, I would say, the right wing fringes of the Japanese political spectrum that advocates uh, nuclear arming. Most of them say in conjunction with the United States, uh, like the United States and United Kingdom have this uh, nuclear sharing arrangement. Um, but that's that's very, very small still. And, and I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, Many people on the outside, many Koreans and Chinese, uh, they, 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 they conflate these uh, issues, but they're very separate. Mark, but can I, can I follow up with a question to you on that? Um, I mean, we often talk about Japan as a nuclear threshold country, if that's the right way to put it. And, you know, in a certain sense, that's a, a function of Japan's advanced technological state. But is it 
it was also a conscious decision, wasn't it? I mean, that basically Japan uh, does want to have the option um, if, if, if the situation became very bad. Very important point, Dana. Yeah, absolutely. Japan is a latent nuclear power. It's a, it's been a policy for many years. It's not an enunciated policy, although every once in a while a Japanese politician will slip and and say uh, honestly that um, that their nuclear technology is for deterrence purposes. You know, some people say that Japan could uh, build a nuclear weapon. Um, uh, you know, in a matter of a few months. That's not correct. Um, uh, it, it would take. Um, uh, at the very least, one year if they just, uh, you know, ignored all safety uh, precautions and everything else and just rushed to do it and, you know, were sloppy and everything. But, you know, it would, it would take two years. And mostly what it would take, would it would take a change in the psyche. Um, because, you know, the Japanese population, we talked about this, they're still very, you know, anti-nuclear. And that anti-nuclear sentiment is probably no more strong than in the scientific community. Uh, so they would have to have a real change in their perspective about uh, Japan's needs. There, there could be such a change, you know, if the United States totally dropped its uh, security commitment, which, you know, looking at President Trump's um, uh, statements uh, uh, about transactional um, alliance arrangements uh, could lead to that. Um, a, a, a Chinese aggression could lead to that. But today, um, the anti-nuclear um, sentiment remains very strong. But, you know, this is a key point, which is... Um you know, also may be in danger of being forgotten as we as we um, become complacent about 75 years of nuclear peace. And that's the point that the United States, uh, the United States is nuclear guarantees to its allies uh, in, in, in Asia Pacific, but also obviously in Europe is probably a, a, a reason for certain countries not to have to make that nuclear choice. And um, if you look at the situation in Germany, for example, Germany is also a very anti-nuclear country, but its politicians have considered the circumstances under which if they felt if, if the United States was no longer guaranteeing um, Germany's defense, what Germany might have to do. I mean, this is pure speculation, and it's not something that I think the German population would support. But these things can change depending on the you know, changes in country's strategic situations. So, um, you know, whatever you, else you think about you know, a transactional view of, of America's alliance commitments, one should also recognize that if those commitments ended, um, the implications for nuclear proliferation could be profound. Mark, can I ask, have discussions like this, have you noticed that discussions like this uh, have become more frequent in Japan over the past few years, at least during the Trump administration, with questions uh, and concerns about uh, the United States' um, alliance commitments um, becoming increasingly uh, strong in certain parts of the world? You know, um, I thought that they might, given all the uh, uh, things that Trump has said that would uh, um, uh, uh, question the credibility of the U.S. commitment. But I don't think the Japanese um, uh, 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 are full of angst about that the way I thought they might be. My reading of it is that uh, they they look at what the United States does less uh, than what uh, Trump says. And they they realize that uh, below Trump, the entire U.S. Uh, bureaucracy is, it remains committed to the uh, alliance. So it hasn't uh, led them into um, questioning uh, the need for their own uh, nuclear weapons. Over the past... Um, uh, decades, Japan uh, several times has uh, has questioned uh, whether they might need nuclear weapons. They had internal studies at several uh, uh, times, and uh, most recently it was about 10 years ago. And each time they, they realized that they don't need them um, because they could uh, rely on the U.S. Um, uh, nuclear umbrella and because it would be so costly and Japan doesn't have a lot of space for nuclear weapons and so forth. Um, I, I hope that if they have another such study that, that, that those uh, conclusions won't change. Maybe to end, uh, hopefully, on a positive question, um, do either of you see signs of optimism regarding nuclear security internationally? And will the legacy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki still be adhered to 25 years from now for the 100th anniversary of the two bombings? You know, it is it is true and hopeful that the United States and Russia have vastly reduced um, their arsenals. Um, 
and um, I mean, they still have very large arsenals, but they brought them down to a level um, that may seem more reasonable compared to the, you know, the, the thousands and thousands of warheads um, that they deployed previously. So, so there is this internet. There has been this international machinery that's that's geared towards um, trying to avoid a nuclear war, and then it still exists, and it, it's still in the psyches and the hearts of a lot of people. Uh, having said that, you know this th this withering away of arms control is something that is very very concerning. I spoke about it uh, about it previously, and you know I mentioned uh, John Hersey, and he said something. Um, before he died in the 1980s in, in an interview, he said something that was um, rather chilling, which was that, I mean, it was also somewhat self-congratulatory if you, if you look at it this way. He said in the 1980s, it, he didn't believe it was so much deterrence in the sense of objective capabilities and objective ability to threaten another country that had preserved the nuclear peace as much as it was memory. And that is the, literally the memory of what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, which, as I say, was somewhat self-congratulatory because he did so much to create that memory. But the fear is that with when that memory is lost, um, the danger can 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 return in a big way. So you know, unless you have um, you know, and in the first instance, it has to be in the United States and Russia, unless you have leaders who are committed to restraining nuclear dangers, um, it's hard to be very optimistic about, about the future. Uh, and, and just to um, uh, amplify uh, Dana's uh, points there, I, I share um, his concern about the breaking down of arms control, uh, the breaking down of, of communications uh, between the superpowers about their nuclear holdings. If we don't extend New START uh, next year, there will be no arms control agreements in place. But this, uh, the memory of Hiroshima, I'll end on a positive note, I, I think it remains pretty strong. Uh, around the world. I mean, Hiroshima, the, the mayor and the governor of the, of the prefecture, uh, uh, promote a very positive uh, uh, image, and they put a lot of emphasis and energy into educating uh, Japanese people and, and global citizens about uh, the dangers of, of nuclear weapons. Um, uh, and and I think, you know, the more people who visit Hiroshima, like I did when I was 17, uh, I think the more you take away uh, these lessons. I was very uh, glad that President Obama uh, was, became the first sitting U.S. president to visit uh, Hiroshima in uh, 2016. Uh, I, I don't imagine um, our current president would, would do that. Um, but um, I, I think this will become more common for world leaders to, to visit Hiroshima. They should visit Nagasaki, too, which has important lessons of its own that are slightly different, but, uh, but still uh, basically the same. Uh, so that you keep that memory and those lessons alive. Well, thank you both, Mark and Dana, for joining me on the show today. It's been incredibly informative and insightful. Thank you, Maya, for sharing it so well. Thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed it. And thank you to our listeners. I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to follow, rate, and subscribe to Sound Strategic on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And to keep up to date on all the latest trends in international security, geopolitics, and defense, be sure to visit the IISS website. Thank you all for listening and see you all next time.